thank you. Um, it's good to be here, and um, it's my first time in your province, so thank you for, for having me. Um, I, I want to make sure that uh, you all feel comfortable. I like to be very interactive. Um, I think we're okay in the back in terms of volume. We good there? Um, and so I'll be asking questions throughout the course of the session. I'm hoping that you're, you're willing to chime in. Um, I don't uh, like coming to these types of events and having the speaker stand for an hour, hour and a half and just blather on. So I want to get your thoughts on, on some of the things that, that are up here. Um, in terms of slides, it's a very short presentation because that's the way it should be because I want to get into real discussion with you about what you are doing, not doing, and those, those kinds of things. So. Um, the slides are actually, I think they're out on your, your conference uh, website, so you can download everything that's, that's up here for yourselves then. So um, let's, let's jump right in. Um, what I want to cover today are a couple of, of key things. And, and again, this is just what, um, what I have planned. If there are things that we start talking about that you want to take a deeper dive into, let's do it. Um, if it seems relevant for the group, I'm happy to go off script and, and, and get to where we need to get to so that at the end of our, our time, together this afternoon, you've gotten out of this session what you'd like to get out of it. Um, my plans are to talk about HR strategic plan. I want to start with the dark side of things. Why do the plans that we have fail so often? And we'll look at that um, in depth. And I always like to start off with the dark side so it just gets brighter from there. I, you know, so many folks, they talk about what you should do and then they end with, now if you don't do it right, here's the bad stuff that happens. Let's get the bad stuff out of the way first. Okay? Um, I want to look at how we link HR back to your organization's overall strategy. Because that's important. Uh, again, so often I've attended like you sessions like this, they talk about HR strategy and they talk about it in a bubble. We can't do that and hopefully you guys know that. So we're gonna look at how HR fits in to all the other pieces of your business in terms of strategy because once you understand that, then you can figure out how you need to build your HR strategy, which is the next point. And then I believe in action planning. Um, one of the, when I was still in business, uh, in private business, I had sent a number of my, my team members off to a conference not unlike this. They, our first department meeting, they came back, had all kinds of great ideas about all the stuff they had heard. And I said, great, what are we going to do with all this? And they did this. They just kind of looked at me. I said, well, you guys just spent a couple days, I forget where the conference was, someplace nice, and you got all these ideas, what are we going to do with it? And so I said, next meeting, I want you to come back with the ideas how we're going to put this stuff in place. So I'm going to hold you guys to the task a little bit, and we'll do a little bit of uh, live action planning in here to figure out how can you use some of the things that we're talking about in here when you get back home uh, to your places of business. So sound like a good agenda? Excellent. Let's hop right in then. So let's talk about these reasons that plans fail. And it shouldn't be a surprise that the number one reason is communication, okay? And we could probably say that for just about everything that we do in HR. If it's messed up, it's because somebody didn't communicate it out effectively. Would you, how many would agree with that? Communication's huge, okay? So let's talk about it first. How many of you know that your organization has a strategic plan? Okay, keep your hands up, please. Keep your hands up. And of those of you that know you have one, how many of you have seen it? Okay, so no hands went down, excellent. Usually I lose about half of the group then. Okay, so how many of you that have seen it know that the average employee has seen it as well? There, I lost some hands, okay. What's wrong with that chain of events? Okay, so we don't have complete communication. Can't reach the plan if you don't know it. So how often do our executives go off to some swanky resort, they disappear for three or four days, we back at the office get lots of stuff done because the executives are gone, and then they come back and they say, yeah, we did our strategic planning. And it's in a nice shiny binder and it goes on a shelf somewhere, never to be seen for the next three years. That's a problem, okay? And I would say that for, for those of you in here that have seen your plan, and your hand went down when I asked if your people have seen the plan, I'd say, okay, what are we going to do about that? To me, that's your first course of action. How can we achieve what's in that plan if the people who are most going to help us hit that plan don't know what it is? Think about it this way. If I asked all of you to get up right now and, and tilt your heads like this, and put blinders on 
and start walking through these tables. How many of you would feel comfortable doing that? You feel comfortable doing this? Should we take them up on the offer? <laughs> no, we don't, want, we don't want workers' comp issues. Okay, why? Why are you not comfortable doing that? Don't know where you're going, okay? We can navigate this, this rather tight space quite easily if we're looking and seeing because we know where we're going. So how often do we ask our people to wear blinders at work so that they don't know where they're going? It's a huge challenge for us in business today. So from a communication standpoint, one of the best things we can do is not hide our plans under the rock, not put them on the shelf. Um, I, I always have to laugh. Uh, the first time I sit down with an organization, I say, let me see your strategic plan, and they take it down off the shelf. It's literally dusty, like you go off the top of the binder, and then you open it and it cracks and creaks because it hasn't literally been opened in months, maybe years. I say, wait a minute. That's the roadmap to success. Why is it not beaten up and dirty and dog-eared and torn pages and inked and highlighted and everything else? So communication, absolutely the most critical reason that our plans fail, and therefore, I believe, the most critical piece to making sure that our plans succeed. OK, second reason plans fail, leadership. No surprise there either. Those of you who said that your plan has not been communicated out to employees. Would anyone like to share why you think that's the case? Who doesn't think they know how to communicate it? Management. Oh, so management doesn't think they know how to communicate it effectively to the people. OK, that's a good reason. Yes, ma'am. I had a situation where I asked a, you know, other, uh, management meeting mm -hmm. that is actually communicated and I started drawing the roadmap of each department okay. to break it down and for it to be accepted and uh, to be brought in. Later on, I was told that we have other stuff to do and that we do that before and we never did that. <laughs> so for those of you in the back, she said that um, she had come up with a plan to communicate and management essentially said we have too much stuff to do, we'll worry about that later. Okay, <laughs> so again, there's communication, but leadership is critical. So that's a great example of what I've got up on here. Why not delegate that? We have someone who's willing to lay the plan out and implement the communication piece, yet manager says, eh, we've got too much to do. Well, no, that's a critical piece. The king should not be painting the lines on the road, <laughs> OK? I don't want to show a hands because we don't want to incriminate the guilty, but think about in your organization whether this is a problem. Is management too tightly holding on to things that they won't allow people further down the company ladder to be successful or to take charge of areas that they can be influencers in? It's huge. And so delegation is key. When we come back from that retreat and we start to communicate things out, now it's OK, you're going to be in charge of this piece, and you've got full authority to make it happen, and you've got this piece, and you have full authority to make it happen, and so on. That's the only way that our plan can be effective. Number three, there's no plan behind the idea. We have a grand idea. Um, I, I was talking with uh, one of the other presenters uh, before the session, and he said, yeah, Ed, uh, oftentimes I go into to my clients, and I need to do some uh, digging around to figure out what's really going on before I can help them. But obviously that takes time and they never want to pay me for that. I said, yeah, that, that's a problem. So what he was explaining to me is that he has clients that come to him with a problem and he says, well, I have a solution for you. And they say, no, 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 here's what we want you to do. Well, wait a minute. Where's there a disconnect? I'm pretty sure this photo is not Photoshopped. <laughs> Might be. I've tried to find out. I've researched to see if this is a fake photo or not. I'm hoping it's photoshopped, because if not, this is really bad. OK? But isn't this going on in our organizations right now? Don't we have various departments, maybe various facilities, working on their own agenda, doing their own thing? And they're not married up with where the organization as a whole is headed. I'm working with an organization back home right now that is, uh, they're going through a big change management process. And one of their facilities is just not on board. 
Now this facility happens to have the longest tenured employees and therefore they're the, 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 the oldest employees in the workforce too. So we could say, yeah, maybe there's some of that. But management is playing into this challenge as well. And what we're finding is that this is going on. Every other facility in the organization is on board. They're reducing waste. Their, their food quality, their food processor, food quality is going up. Less waste, better use of the natural resources that, that are coming in, except for this one plant. All because they won't get behind the idea. The management team in that plant has no plan for taking what corporate has done with this idea and saying this is how we're going to implement it here. We've got some unique challenges that maybe the other facilities don't have. How are we going to do this? And so, while hopefully our results aren't this drastic, I want you to think about whether you have maybe multiple facilities that aren't all on the same page, or it's just the, the departments that are in silos that come back to communication, or we just not, we're not all working towards that same idea. We know where we want to go, but the plans are very divergent in how to get there. Okay? Fourth reason plans fail. Michael Scott. Um, what, was, uh, what was Michael Scott's uh, worst trait as a manager, if you could sum it up in a word or two? <laughs> You're having trouble narrowing it down to one or two words, probably. <laughs> Shout some out. Passive Thank you. Okay, so he's passive. Okay. What else? Flighty. Yeah. So... <laughs> kind of flavor of the month, you know, whatever was hot that day, that was, that was key for him. What else? Okay, clueless, maybe by choice, okay? You know, if you're a fan of the show, you know that he must have been a successful sales rep at some point in time. So maybe it's a case of Peter's principle where he just got promoted to his level of incompetence, okay? But think about, he was always off having his adventures. He was always in la-la land, doing whatever, assumed that things were running smoothly back at the office. Meanwhile, mayhem was going on. Dwight's setting the office on fire. Jim's putting Dwight's stapler in jello. I mean, all these things are going on, and he's just like, ah, hey, things are good. We got sales coming in or whatever. How many of us have management folks that are like that? That the numbers are good right now, so we won't deal with the problem because the numbers are so good. What happens when the numbers aren't good? What happens when we fail to manage our people once we've communicated the plan to them? Because communicating the plan out is only one piece of it. We then have to manage them, and we'll look at that today. This, this idea of passive management, of just assuming that we've done a good job communicating, our folks know what's going on, not enough. And the fifth reason plans fail is motivation. Uh, Wharton has done some studies over the last couple years about employee ownership. Not in terms of dollars ownership, but in terms of their, their personal view of their ownership of the organization and the ideas. And what they found is that companies that struggle in executing their strategy Every single one of them said, yes, we struggle with employee engagement and our employees taking ownership of problems in the organization. There is a direct correlation. It is impossible for us to meet our corporate goals, to meet our departmental goals, our facility goals, heck, all the way down to an individual production line, if you want to get that, that deep, if our folks don't take ownership of the situation. Can any of you share an example of a situation where, that you dealt with where maybe someone on the phone you were working with or one of your own employees took ownership of the situation and what that outcome was? Really? I don't know if you're bashful or if that's the state of customer service in the world today. Yes, thank you. Okay.
Sure. So I talked to the vice president and said, well, the message is sent to the other people who are who is more important than that. Mm -hmm. So this week he said, okay, I'll sit down and talk to him. Okay. I sat down and talked to him. And I said, look, I didn't understand that. I wish the person who was complaining would have come to see me, but I appreciate it. Okay, how sure. So he took it upon himself to say, I'm going to go talk to him directly about that. So okay. is that more of the issue? Sure. So we have a situation where a manager leaves a meeting early to attend to something with a child. Meanwhile, other folks have dedicated their time and effort to get to this meeting. And the message sent is, eh, you know, my kid's important, but you're not. Okay, now if it was an emergency, yeah, I think we'd all say, that's okay. Go, to, go take care of your family. But that's a, you know, when, when I look at that, not only is that a, a serious lack of respect on that person's part, but it really does convey a, a pretty poor message to those that we're working with. And that comes back to personal ownership. Now, what's the motivation behind asking our people to commit? What are we doing to keep them motivated? I mean, we could spend all afternoon talking about that topic. But when I think about employee motivation, I think about it this way. Uh, I believe HR is relatively simple. In essence, we come up with a plan that will attract, motivate, and retain people. Those people come to us and they say, yes, I will work for you in exchange for what you're offering. We shake hands and they start. Is that not really what the employment process comes down to? Okay, I know I'm simplifying it. So what happens a year later when that same person is at every meeting with their head on the table, completely disengaged? Whose fault is that? Is it their fault? Is it management's fault? Is it our fault as HR people for hiring the wrong person? I, I don't know. It doesn't really matter whose fault it is. The point is that somewhere along the line of that last year, motivation went away. What changed? What changed in that individual from the person that sat across the desk and shook our hand and said, yes, for $70,000, I'll do that job for you. Now, all of a sudden, that's not enough money, or the perks aren't enough, or whatever it is. Something has changed in the motivation. And what I would ask you to think about, when you ask for something more of your people, you're changing the rules of the game. So how many of you have given a 7% pay raise recently to someone other than for a promotion? Anybody? Given out 7% pay raises? Didn't think so. But that's what most studies say is the threshold amount to get someone to change their behavior. 7%. And so we wonder why at, at performance review time, we tell someone they've done a great job, we give them new stretch goals, and then we give them a 2% raise. And they don't really act any differently. And we say, but we gave you a 2% raise. Yeah, but in their perception, the value proposition has changed. So has that 2% really impacted my motivation? Now, I get there's more to motivation than just money, but just, just play with me here for a minute, OK? So when we think about this, anytime we ask our people to step up, what are we doing to balance those scales out again? Because if we don't balance the scales out, we're never going to get that ownership from our people. Now, I'm not saying don't give raises when all you can do is afford 2%. For Pete's sake, take care of your people. But if we're thinking that 2% is going to get them to give us ownership thinking and, and, and true motivation, no. What we're giving them is pepperoni on their pizza every Friday night, when you really think about it, OK? So again, we could spend all afternoon talking about motivation theories, but that's a huge problem. Even if we do everything else on these top five reasons plans fail correctly, and then we fail to motivate our people behind the plan, we've got a huge, huge problem on our hands. So let's um. Let's ask the basic question. What is our most important asset? What is it? OK, your HR folks like me, you better darn well say people. OK, and some of you probably have you know, really high end machinery and equipment and diagnostic and, and, and state of the art facilities. Yes. What's, what's your percent of your budget that's dedicated to all things people? Do you guys know? 85%. Dang. Highest I've ever heard. Well, because of service signals, you have nothing but 
Okay, so nothing but service. It's just your people. That's it. Okay, makes sense. Do you mean the salary or? The whole nut. Anything, if it has to do with your people, what's the percentage that's in your budget? Anyone less than 30%? Really? You're less than 30% is dedicated to people? Yeah. We Would have you? more with um, sales, logistics, okay. all very high. In okay. All right. When it comes to HR training and all of those stuff, they're kind of like. Okay, but I'm talking about not just training budget, but I'm yeah, talking about the salary, everything, everything. Salary. benefits, all of it. Okay, yeah, so when you think about this, think about, th let's just go with the low end, okay, of 30%, because that seems to be the, the kind of lower end for most organizations. It's the single biggest line item that we have in most businesses, is our people. And so that means all of you in here are responsible for that 30%, a full third of the business. That's why we have to do HR strategic planning. We have to manage that piece of our business. I don't believe that HR is just about taking care of our people. And I know I'm a guest here in your province. Please don't run me out, OK? Um, I, I, had, uh, I was facilitating an HR certification study group last year. And like you do in most of those types of events, we had everyone introduce themselves. And uh, one, one young lady, you know, it came, came time for her to introduce herself, she said, uh, I'm new to HR, and uh, I came out of the social work community. I said, oh, great. I said, why'd you join HR? Her response was, because I want to show our employees that not all HR people are mean. <laughs> and I said, OK, well, that's a good reason to get into HR. OK, what's wrong with that view? Why is it wrong? I agree. Does that mean I'm advocating that you be out, be mean to people? I, think I hope not. HR is looked at more as an enforcer rather than an, en an enabler. Okay. So I'm I'm there with my little checklists of everything, watching you, catching you doing things wrong. Okay. That's never going to get us to the table. I think you guys know this. Okay. That if we can't be strategic partners, I don't care how good of an inspector you are. I don't care how tight your policies are. I don't care how up-to-date your job descriptions are. I don't care how good your HRIS software is. None of that. doesn't matter. Those are all tools. Would you go to a mechanic who had the best tools but has never worked on your particular vehicle before? Or better yet, would you go to a mechanic who only works on boats and have that individual fix your car? They have the best tools, probably some very similar tools that an auto mechanic would have. But you would never do that. Okay? And that's why we need to make sure that we are using the right tools that we have to solve our HR strategy issues. We have to take that step back, and that's where we're going to head today. Okay? So, Let's look at a strategic plan. Okay, it's sitting right there. And we're not going to get, you guys have all heard of the SWOT analysis. Yeah, we're not doing that today because you guys know all that stuff. Okay, if you don't, come see me afterwards. I'll give you the five minute lowdown on SWOT. All right. So here sits a strategic plan for a company. Doesn't matter what kind of company, it's sitting there. And what are some things, and if you have printed the slides out, don't cheat, don't look. If you haven't, great. What needs to go be considered in a company's strategic plan? Environmental An environmental scan. And what do you mean by that? Both and what's in industry. Okay. Industry issues, both internal to us and external. I like that one. What else? Resources available. What kind of resources? Anything from people to equipment to. Okay. People, equipment, technology, money available. Okay. What else needs to be put into that plan? Or, or will we'll impact that plan, excuse me. Business okay. Company business plan, stakeholder issues, whether that be in um, terms of customers, vendors, um, if you're a publicly traded company, your shareholders. Okay. 
take a look at something I came up with. I believe, and you guys hit some of them, okay? We're going to go around the wheel, and we're going to look at these six items, and I want to talk about what HR needs to do with each one of these items. Because we have to have a say in each of these items. This is where we come up with HR strategic plan. We have to know what's going on in these pieces and how that relates back to HR. So let's start at the top. Uh, someone back here mentioned market trends. It's there. Why does HR have to know about market trends? To connect our workforce with Okay, so if the market's good for our product or service, then we know we need to get more people in. Okay? So in terms of what's the buying power for our product or service, that's a good one. What else goes into market trends? There might be emerging areas of business or new areas okay. of growth for the organization. Okay. Okay, so. Gaps in our organization, how we need to develop capacity within our okay, so we want to get into perhaps some new lines of business. We want to get into um, a new geographic market. What do we need to consider for that? What are the impacts on HR to doing that? So if we look at those things, what, how does that, if we're going to now plan for HR based on those market trends, what do we need to be thinking about to address market trends? Like if we're like diversifying, like let's say we're the new business, new products into an existing business. Okay. We have the resources to, 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 to meet the new markets. And if it's just um, um, existing markets, existing business, it's just development. Okay. Do we have to add? Do we need more people to okay. marketing and sales? And do we have to hire more people? Do we have to get a special a specialist on the out there? Okay. Do so analyzing our talent, do we need to hire more people? Yeah. Okay. I hear that all the time. Do we need to hire more people? Because that's more work for us, right? We have to hire more people. But it's, thank you. How do we train what we have? How many of you would say one of your biggest challenges is a talent shortage. Really? Only a handful of you. Wow. OK. So the rest of you are not only fully staffed, but your people are fully productive and ready to go. Really? Or you're just, you're, yeah, I know we're after lunch here, and you're probably, if you, I saw some of the desserts, you're probably in carb comas now. OK. Um, it's more than just do we need to hire more people. If you want to be strategic, Yes, that should be on your mind, but it shouldn't be the first thing out of your mouth. Management comes to you and says, hey, we're diversifying our portfolio. We're going to grab market share with, with a, um, we're going to buy out another company. We're going to open up another facility. The first thing out of your mouth should not be, how many people do we need? What should it be? What do we have now? And what kind of people do we need? It's not about numbers, OK? It's about the purity of those numbers. When you hire someone based on market trends, if you're hiring them for what you need today, you're in trouble. We need to be prognosticators in HR. So we better buddy up to marketing and research and development and finance and all our other partners who know where our business is headed so that we can not only look to attract the people who are going to be valuable to us in five years, ten years down the road, but we can look at our existing workforce and say, what do they need in order to be productive three, four, five years from now when their job is 100% different? Right now, we're you guys in pretty good economy overall? Yes, no? Depends. <laughs> What's the first thing that gets cut when the economy tanks? 
training, always. Does that make any sense to you? Why not? You, sh you shook your head no. Why not? Well, when things are covered, you're left standing still with your horse and your staff that are on police. Or exactly. So at a time when we need our people to be at their absolute best, when we're trying to run lean and mean, what do we do? We take away their best tools, which is their training and development, that help them to run lean and mean and be productive for us. It doesn't make any sense. But that's a market trend from an economy standpoint, and we're going to get down to environmental change. We're going to hit that there as well. But we have to be thinking about that. How do we lobby for that training and development budget to keep up with what's going on in the marketplace? How do we lobby to ensure that that's an investment in our people? It's not a line item cost, which means we have to start talking in terms of return on investment. In the interest of time, let's keep rolling. Let's talk about key business metrics. What key business metrics do you need to be able to discuss to do your job better as an HR person? I'm sorry? Uh, turnover. It's always what I hear first. Do I care about turnover? Thank you. It depends. The attorney answer. It depends. What does it depend on? Who's leaving? Who's leaving? Thank you. Oh, I have 10% turnover. And guess what? Last month, everyone who left was a poor performer. I'll take that 10% all day long. All right? Oh, I have 3% turnover, but it's our most valuable people. I'm shaking in my shoes. I want to know what's going on. I don't care about turnover as a global thing. You need to be able to talk about turnover in terms of the kind of turnover it is. I have a client who's in the... Um, long-term care business. And they rave about the fact that their one facility, and that, that's a hard business to staff, okay? A lot of, usually a lot of turnover. But they, they love the fact that they're at 3% turnover. And they, they, well, I went in and I took a look at that particular facility. Like, this is, why are you at 3% turnover, okay? This company's been around for about 50 years. They've grown tremendously. This particular facility is one of their earliest ones. Now, they don't have some of the original employees after 50 years, but they've got employees that have been there 20, 30 years. Okay? It's rare. What they're finding is it's the younger people that are turning. They don't want to do those jobs. Well, what's going to happen when these employees that have been there for 20, 30 years, who are all now in their late 50s to early 60s, start retiring in the next five years? All of a sudden, they're going to go from 3% turnover to probably 80% turnover because that stable piece of the workforce that they could count on is going to be gone. Meanwhile, HR has been patting itself on the back, getting its shoulder out of socket, doing so, saying, we got 3% turnover. Not when you really look at what's going on. Okay, So turnover itself, not a key business metric. We have to be able to talk about what kind of turnover. Where is it happening? Is it a shift, a department, a specific job? Is it a gender, a race, an age group? How can we slice that turnover down to figure out where the problem is and if there's a problem? I have a client that has horrible turnover on one shift and one shift only. And we've been trying to figure it out. And we finally figured it out. It's a racial problem. They cannot keep African Americans on that shift. Now, we're still trying to figure out why and what's really going on there. But whites, Hispanics, Asians, no problem. They stay. Something more is going on there, clearly. And it's been going on for a while. That's a key business metric. Not the fact that the turnover is relatively low on that shift. It's that the turnover comprises one group of people. Those are the strategic types of analyses we need to be doing. That's what our management wants to hear about. That management team for years kept hearing, oh, we've got very little turnover. 
And when I was in there working on something else, I said, what's up with this right here? And they said, oh, well, you know, that, that's been going on for a while now. Well, who's looked at it? Do you guys know the situation you're putting yourselves in with turning one group like that? Clearly, there's a message out on the street because they're not coming into apply now. Bigger problem. What other key, let's not just talk about Turner. What other key business metrics do we need to be in tune with as HR professionals? Okay, how so? Okay, so if we have performance management tools, are they effective? How do we know if they're effective? What are we measuring with our performance management tools? Thank you. Are the goals and objectives being achieved? Now that sounds pretty doggone obvious. And I'm not going to ask the guilty to raise your hands. Is that what really is being measured in your performance management process right now in your organization? Or is it more, hey HR, uh, Joe's supervisor out on, on, on plant line two hasn't done his performance reviews yet, go get him. So we're measuring whether they get done or not and not what's in them. And I take it one step further. Not just whether those goals and objectives are being met, but are the appropriate goals and objectives being planned out for our workforce? A friend of mine's in banking. He switched banks, um, was given a set of goals, thought, hey, these are reasonable goals. I can hit these things this year. He hit them in May. Is that a problem? Yeah. Why? Were they not challenging enough? Some would say they were. He landed a monster deal that, that really put him over the top. Okay. What's that? Maybe not realistic. The challenge is, we said motivation's an issue. What's in it for him for the rest of the year now? We know he's hit his yearly goal already. It's May. What's he doing for the next seven months? That's a key performance metric. Not only does it come back to, were we measuring the right things? Wasn't enough of a stretch goal? Was it realistic? And all those other important things. But what are we going to do with that person? Is he really a superstar? And if so, what are we going to do about it? In a good way. <laughs> How are we going to tap into this guy? But more importantly, what are we going to do? He lucked into this big deal. Great. Maybe we need to amend those performance goals now. Maybe we need to add some more things on. Maybe we need to figure out how he landed that big deal and start talking to the other branch managers about what they should be doing similar to what he did. Are we doing any of that kind of knowledge sharing? What other key business metrics are critical? Level of engagement. We're talking about employee engagement, okay? How do we quantify that? I just got a shrug. That's the tough one. Does anyone have a good way to quantify employee engagement? You might use an engagement. Some organizations have an employee engagement survey. Engagement survey, OK. So they would have key metrics that they would look at based learning and then setting targets and Perhaps. key drivers of engagement in it. Mm -hmm. Sure. So we can do that. We can put an employee engagement survey out there. I would say even absent doing that, there are other markers that indicate some of which we've talked about. Productivity, turnover. Um, we can look at um, attitude. That gets into a, another tough one to uh, identify a little bit there. But um, when we think about engagement, or any key business metric, but one like engagement, that's a little fuzzier to put a number to, I would say be very, very careful saying that's a key business metric. Because you've got to be able to measure it. Now, if you do the engagement survey and you've got some hard data to measure against and you can lay some plans down, perfect. 
I cut my, uh, my HR and, and operations teeth at UPS. And, you know, of course, key business metric is do we get box from point A to point B in the shortest amount of time possible, okay? And so uh, the facility that I was uh, in charge of for HR, we processed between 35 and 50,000 packages a day. And on average, we would get about six boxes into our facility of those 50,000 that didn't belong there. So it's not a bad ratio when you think about it. But if that's your box sitting there that's not supposed to be, that's a problem. And so that was a big deal for UPS, and we could measure that. But here's the problem. We would get dinged for those boxes. It went against our performance review. Does that make any sense to you? Why not? You're like, you even got the forehead thing going on. Why not? Why does it make no sense? It wasn't our fault. We weren't responsible for it. But back then, we didn't have the tracking capabilities that they have now. So all we knew is when it got to a point. So what did that do from a, it's a key business metric. Are packages getting from A to B? Are they getting to the right spots? But we're holding people accountable for what they call a missort who didn't missort the package. We found them. No hands. But how many of you have metrics like that? How many of you have something that you're measuring someone on and they do not have complete control over whether or not they can hit that goal? either as an individual or as a team. If you do, you're killing motivation, which is going to kill your plan. Your people have to have the ability to impact whatever performance pieces you're giving them responsibility for. It's absolutely critical. Other business metrics that we need to be worried about. Poor training. Percentage completion of training. OK. Um, what's wrong with that? Okay, does it change my base? So I didn't go to sexual harassment prevention training. Woohoo! So what? Is that a big deal? Apparently not. You guys haven't responded. I mean, I guess it's not a big deal. If I've never sexually harassed someone, and I've been to the training each year for the last 10 years, and I don't go this year, is that a problem? I don't know. But that's what I'm hearing we're measuring. It's a problem because Ed didn't go, and that impacts our percentage completion rate. Maybe I'm different. I don't care about completion rates. What do I care about? Effectiveness. Is the training doing what it's supposed to do? Now, I will agree. If I'm not going to the training, you can't do what it's supposed to do. But from a key, if you want to be a strategic thinker, it has to not be, did Ed go to the training? It's, yeah, Ed's going to go to the training because there are other consequences if he doesn't. But what's he getting out of it? Is he implementing the behaviors that we expect coming out of that training? That's the only reason we train people, is to change behavior. If we're putting them through training and they're not changing their behavior, something's broken. So I would say that your key business metric is, let's go back to the ROI of your training initiatives and say, we've spent $15,000 on this training initiative. What did we get out of it? Now, in some cases, we know we've got to check the box. Everyone's got to go to harassment prevention training. We've got to check the box. And what we get out of it is, legal compliance and we don't get lawsuits and discrimination complaints. OK, good. Maybe there's not a true ROI in, in business terms on something like that. I get that. But if we're doing training to increase productivity, to change people's behavior, then the metric has to be, did the behavior change? And what, how, do we, how do we know that it changed? We made more widgets. We made more customers happy. I don't know, whatever it is. That's what we need to be measuring if we want to be strategic players, not the fact that the training was completed or not. And I'll give you a perfect example. How many of you work in a, in a uh, machine type environment where maybe you have your employees lock out that equipment to keep them safe when they're working on it? A couple of you, OK? And all of your mechanics go through that lockout training, probably annually, OK? Now, what, how many of your mechanics don't use lockout? that you're aware of. I had a mechanic, had been through lockout training for 10 years straight. 
I get a call, there's been an injury. He lost a couple of the tops off his fingers. Didn't lock out. Well, gee, he's been through the chaining. We checked the boxes. But all along, he wasn't always locking out. So his behavior hadn't changed through the training. There was some disconnect. He decided, I'm at the far end of the facility. This repair is going to take me two minutes. My lock is literally a 10-minute walk away. Doesn't make any sense. I'm going to do this. He paid for it, OK? So where is the behavior change element in our training? That's the key business metric. Other key business metrics. This is a big one. That's why we're spending time on this one. Retention rates on critical workforce segments. OK? So that would tell me that you have identified Who's critical for you? Again, I don't want to show of hands, but how many of you have identified who's critical? OK. Some of you give me hands anyway. Good. I would challenge you to go back and look at those lists. If you haven't identified, that's a to-do. What positions are critical? One list. Who is critical? Another list. They could be very different. OK. Why this is so important is when we think about the lean times. Do we have the superstars that we need? Do we have the right people in the right positions? That old adage, the right seat on the bus. Maybe we've got people over here that are critical to us, but they're not in a critical position. Let's figure that out. And the reason I'd like you to take another look at your critical positions is, Oftentimes, when I ask a customer that and they give me the list, it's everybody at the top of the food chain. And I say, well, wait a minute. Where do you have most of your turnover? Oh, it's these people over here. Yeah, and they're all your customer-facing people. Why are you not focusing on that? I don't care how great a widget you have. If the people that are, are selling that widget are horrible, or the people that are installing that widget in your customers' homes are horrible, who cares how good the widget is? Maybe those are critical people. So think long and hard about when you're looking at retention, who is critical to the success of your organization? I gave you the UPS example. Prior to me giving that story, who would you have said is the most important person that ensures that your package gets to you on time? Who would it be? Who would you have said prior? Drivers, OK? Because that's who we associate. That's the person who brings us our package, OK? But the driver only delivers what's on his or her truck every day. It's some part-time, hungover college student at 3 in the morning who's throwing stuff in the wrong trucks. And I know, because I was one of them, OK? <laughs> and so I never once saw a customer while I was in that role. But if I put your package on the truck next to you, you're not getting it today. So, but that message was never communicated. I didn't know I was critical to those customers getting there, but that term was never even used with me. It was, you get the boxes, they go on this truck in this order. Okay, boss, got it. Get it in the right order on the truck so the driver can, can deliver his route easy. That was the message that was sent. There was nothing about the end result of the customer. Nothing. Now, I'm going back 30 years, but that, you know. So think about who's critical. Okay, let's keep rolling around here, okay? Financial analysis. What are some financial indicators you have to be smart about with regards to HR? O -M -A. I'm sorry? O M and A. O M and A. <laughs> Go ahead and spell it out for me. Your, your, what we were talking about earlier, like your overall wages, your, your whole overall wages, your overall package, okay? I would even go so far as to say not only how much is it as a whole, but look at the parts. Are we spending money where we should be spending money? How many of you have a company picnic or some other kind of gathering? Only a couple of you, OK? How many of you have always had a company picnic? And if you tried to cancel the company picnic, what would happen? Who would, would people revolt or would management revolt? OK, so if people revolt, that's a good thing. But if management's the one saying we've always had it, that's a problem. Why are, we, why are we spending the money where we're spending it? 
has to be critical for HR. Not because we've always had the pig roast for the barbecue or we always took the people to the amusement park or whatever it is your tradition is. If the people love it, it's money well spent. If they don't, get rid of it. Put the money elsewhere. I have a client that spends $40,000 on their company picnic taking people to the local amusement park and only 30% of the people go. Something's wrong with that. And of that 30%, a bunch of them complain because the employees are free but family members are five bucks. Really? <laughs> okay, it costs 55 to get into the place normally and we're feeding you. We're asking you for five bucks and they're complaining about it. Why are you spending $40,000 on 30% of your workforce, half of whom are complaining? Doesn't make any sense to me. But when I asked them, what was the response that I got? We've always had a party, Ed. We gotta have the party. But your people are saying they really don't care about the party. This same company gives you a, a, a gift certificate on your birthday, good for a free cake at the local bake shop. And 99% of these things get turned in every year and it costs them 10 bucks a head. What does that tell you? People like that, 10 bucks a head. You know, ask your people what they want. Is the package that you're putting together and spending money on what they want? And you better ask them regularly because guess what? It changes all the time. And it's different based on the age of your workforce, where they're at in life. I mean, all kinds of things change, okay? But make sure, I know for me, um, again, maybe I'm a contrarian. Uh, I'm not big on uh, company swag. I never was. Um, was never big on, oh, I got a company t-shirt, I got the company mug, I got the company whatever plastered all over me. No. I, I was at a company function one time with the organization I used to work with. They gave us temporary tattoos. I'm like, really? You want me to put a temporary tattoo on of the company logo? What are you smoking? Because maybe it needs to be in our benefit package, okay? Come on, really? Now, I know it was fun. There was a lot. We were changing our logo and all that. So I, I get it. I get it from a marketing perspective. I do. But how many of your people feel the same way? I don't need another company mug or something with the logo on it. And they might be very good employees who are very proud to work for you, quite honestly. But that mug doesn't mean anything. Okay? So what would mean something to them? So when we look at the financial analysis of what we're doing in HR, Again, I come back to, do we know where we're spending our money and why? If we're spending a ton of money on medical-related benefits, okay, well, well, is it the right mix that our people want? I've had some organizations say, yeah, we, we cover our people's uh, complete medical coverage. Like, wow, okay, good for you. Yeah, but they really don't want that. Then stop doing it. We've got a bunch of young people who think they're going to live forever. Okay, well, we know they're not, but if they don't want the benefits, take the money and give it, put it in some other place where they want it right now. What else should we be considering with financial analysis? What else do we have to know about? Okay. So... What is turnover costing me in terms of salary, benefits, retraining, all of that stuff? And again, we have already in the key business metric know whether it's good or bad turnover that we're having, but what is it really costing us? Because if you have a situation where perhaps you're just the front screener and then you turn the folks over to a hiring manager, do they know the cost of a bad hire? We often get blamed for it but I'm willing to bet that for the most part, you guys are not the only ones talking to prospective hires. And so does management understand the cost of a bad hire? Because I'm willing to bet some of your managers believe in the warm body syndrome. They got a pulse, yep, get them in here. I'm good with that. No, no, keep the seat open until you get the right person. That's a hard one to sell. It's extremely hard to sell. What other financial metrics do you have to know about? Okay. Okay. So, do we know where our pay system fits? Now, when I hear market, I think of two things. I think our geographic market, and I think our industry market. Do we want to lead the market in pay? Maybe. Do you want to lag the market in pay? Maybe. 
Do you want to be right on target? Maybe. I don't know. Those are philosophical questions. But you have to ask them. You have to know what's going on. What if you are leading the market in pay and you still can't find good people? What's that telling you? Something else. It's not comp. Okay? Yet I will get those kinds of questions. Ed, you know, we're paying more. We've done the salary studies and we're paying more and we can't get good people in. Okay, well, something else is the matter. Either with the offering or the company. Maybe your employer brand is not very good. Okay? There's something else going on there. We have to know that. That's a good one. What else do we have to know from a financial standpoint? HR to staff ratio. Is that a key financial analysis piece? I'm sorry? Oh, the, the return on investment. Okay, on your HR staff or on? Okay. Okay, all right. So I was just talking with an organization of 280 employees. How many HR people, not should they have, did they have? Anyone want to guess? One. One. <laughs> no. Close. She said 10. They had 11. Yeah, exactly. I said, what's going on? Now, I'm starting to think, okay, maybe there's people under the HR umbrella that aren't real, quote, HR people. You know, maybe accounting's in there. Maybe there's something else going on. Now, I will say they had payroll in there. Okay, good. They had a learning and development person and a payroll person and a hiring person and um, an employee relations person. I mean, I could go on. I'm like, okay, your ratio is like 1 to 10. What is going on here? It's crazy. No way you can sell me on that return on investment. No way. Okay? Now, we could stand here and debate what the actual ratio should be. It doesn't really matter. Are we getting the return? If they were getting the return on that 1 for 10, okay, great. But they weren't. They weren't. There was no way they were. Okay? So what I would say is we focused a lot on our own financial analysis. But if you want to be a true strategic player, and be able to marry your plan up with the companies, you better be able to talk in terms of the company financials as well. Do you know what your company's profit margin is? Do you know what the revenue is? Even if you're a not-for-profit, you better know those, those numbers. I talk to not-for-profit HR folks, say, well, we're not-for-profit. I don't need to know. We, we don't have a profit. Then you're going out of business. Just because you're a not-for-profit <laughs> doesn't mean you don't make money. <laughs> Those are two very different things, okay? Do we know how our company makes its money? Oh, yeah, we, we mow lawns. Is that really how you make your money? Or is it on how efficiently you mow those lawns? Is it in all the other landscape? Maybe the lawn mowing is a lost leader, and it's the selling of other landscape services and the snow plowing and all that other kind of stuff where you really make your money. I would say as HR people, we have to know that when we're sitting at that board table and we're trying to integrate our strategic plan into the business plan. Do we know how our company makes money? And what causes us to not make money? Again, I, don't want, I just want you to think about this, no show of hands. If you have salespeople, when's the last time you spent some time with a salesperson interacting with customers? If you have people out on the floor When's the last time you've walked the floor at 3 o'clock in the morning to see what was going on? When's the last time maybe you hopped on a truck with a truck driver for the day to see what her life is like? As HR people, if we don't do those things on occasion, we have no way to figure out how our company's truly making money and our role in it. You have to do those things. All right, we're going to keep, keep rolling around here. So someone had mentioned about the environmental changes, okay? Um, and those can be anything from laws changing that we've got to comply with to um, political changes, that's a good one, okay? To the actual environment outside changing. If you are an outdoor-based business, okay, then you're cyclical and you should know that. 
that maybe you go into a different mode based on the season of the year, okay? Um, so we have to, I'm sorry? Technology changes, okay? You mentioned that you're mostly people. I bet you rely on technology a lot to get those people doing what they need to do, correct? So we've got to stay up on those kinds of things. How many of you know what your customers say about your organization? Only a handful. That's a problem, gang. Why do we need to know? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Why as HR folks should we care what our customers think? Isn't that you know business development's job? Why do we have to know this? Exactly. If our employees can't make a perfect widget, they can't mow the perfect lawn, they can't care for that patient properly, whatever it is that you do, we've got unhappy customers. And it usually comes back to something related to our employees. And does it come back to motivation? Does it come back to training? Does it come back to poor hiring? Does it come back to performance management? I mean, all the things that we've talked about, all right? So maybe you're not, you know, if you're in the restaurant business, you can get out on Yelp and you can see what customers think about your business. The rest of us, it might be a little bit more difficult. But I'm willing to bet your sales team knows this. I'm willing to bet if you have a uh, customer facing positions, they have a sense for what your customers think. Go talk to them. Because after all, it's not about making the widgets at our company. What's it about? The people managing the widgets. Not the people managing the widgets. The selling not the, the selling the widgets. We can make them all day long. If we can't sell them, we got problems. All right? So we have to figure out what are our customers telling us. It's not just a sales function. We have to know that. Okay? What do we want to know about our competitors? Their strengths, their weaknesses, okay, all the whole SWAT thing for them. Who they are. I'm sorry? What's that? What talent can we steal from them? It is just a big churn after all. Okay, I know back home, the people that we want to hire are already employed. Quite honestly, it's a churn. I take from you, you take from me, and she takes from us, and yeah. But I would say, who are our competitors for talent? If you're making pharmaceuticals, it may not just be the other pharmaceutical down the road. Maybe there's a restaurant that has the kind of person that you want working on your front lines. Maybe they're a competitor. Who is the competitor for talent? Do we know that? So often, um, I'll have people tell me, HR will say, yeah, well, we've got 5% turnover compared to the industry average, which is 10%. So? You're the only company within 100 miles of here that does what you do. Who cares what the industry average is? Tell me what your turnover is compared to other organizations that are hiring the same sorts of people you're hiring. That's a more critical piece in all of this. We have to know what our competitors are paying. What kind of benefits are they offering? What kind of work environments do they have? Are their people happier than our people? How do we find these things out? Come to events like this and network and talk. Because some of you are competitors, okay? But it doesn't mean we can't share information. What's working, what's not, okay? Because the reality is, if we get that mix correct for our people, we don't have to risk losing them. So if we sit here and we know we're doing something right and we share with, with a fellow HR person, it shouldn't matter. It really shouldn't matter. Okay? Okay, we're coming down to the home stretch. So we take all of those things. And again, if we're at a you know, 50,000 foot overview here on the strategic planning piece. But you have to take those six things and work them into your HR plan. And then you've got to figure out how does it cross through these other departments? We kind of hit on some of that in our last discussion, okay? How we have to tie in perhaps to the technology that's being used. And how is that making us better? Is it making us better? Is it getting in our way? What about sales? How do we support them properly? What kind of training does that team need? Do we know what skill sets our sales team really has to have? 
You'd be surprised how many sales folks out there can't close a deal. They can talk all day. They can smile. They can paint your services and your widgets in the best place possible. Customers love it when, when those sales reps come in because they bring pizza and donuts and all these other things. But they can't close the deal. That's a problem. Okay? Those are great account managers because they keep our people happy. But if we can't close the deal, then we're not a salesperson. I'm amazed at the number of organizations that will tell me that's one of their biggest challenges. We had all these opportunities, we can't close the deals. Okay, then you got the wrong people in the seats, most likely. Okay, so what we have to do is we've got to think about what's up here at the organization level for a strategic plan, how does it bleed in, and then how does HR support and get impacted by those other functions? And we talked a lot about that on the previous slide, but that's critical. Now, to pull it back home, um, I want you to think about our, our impact, okay? Some things on here we've talked about, others we've not. But look at all the things that our HR strategic plan, if we talk and, and we, we flesh out those six items we just talked about and we put them in here, look at all the things that should be reflected in our plan. How many of you have a current succession plan for leadership in your organization, okay? How many of you have it for mid-level people? Okay, all right. So about a third of the room answered both of those. Huge problem. If we know we're in a tight labor market and perhaps your turnover isn't where you want it to be, wouldn't you want to be thinking about your succession planning? What happens if that critical employee that we talked about, you list out, gets ill? wins the lottery, I don't know, they just don't come to work tomorrow or ever again. What do we do? What positions like that keep you up at night? That's, that's huge. A good HR strategic plan fleshing out those six items we just talked about will tell us where we need to succession plan and what priority we need to do it. Most organizations have a plan for their top, top management, CEO, C-suite, it's usually there. Okay, most times a board will require that it's there. But who's really the nuts and bolts of our organization? Our frontline management and our mid-management. Do we succession plan for those positions? Do we succession plan for our lower level positions? Again, we could talk for a couple of hours just on succession planning. It's so critical to everything we just talked about from a strategic standpoint. Um, we, we, we talked about our organization changes, culture changes in the organization. All of these things can get reflected in our plan or our plan can impact, but we have to have one. Would you believe it that I had a business owner say, we don't really have a culture around here. I said, what? You have a culture. You just don't know what it is, which is bad. That's like saying your own family has no traditions. Come on, we all have traditions, okay? And so when we think about the cultural imperatives, what are we trying to do in our organization? If we want to be one of those employers of choice, what does that mean? We want to have a good employment brand. What does that mean to us in today's environment? So when we think about you know, that cultural mindset, I've got a, a customer right now who's, uh, who's saying that, that he thinks the culture's fine. Culture is fine but it's not what his employees want. And he's, he's bucking at that. Like, you are in a highly creative industry that attracts young, now Gen Z folks in. I'm telling you, these are the things they want. It seems ridiculous to you to put a Keurig machine in the, the break room. But what's it really gonna cost you? I don't care that you don't think it adds value, but people are telling you, it'd be nice to have flavored coffees and all this stuff, can you get us a Keurig? And this guy can afford it, but he's like, ah, I think it's ridiculous. Who cares what you think? What are your people saying to you? There are times I wanna shake him, but he's bigger than me, okay? So we have to think about culturally, how is, 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 is our culture right now what it should be, and if not, then what plans are we going to put in place to get it to change? Which comes back to our strategic plan. 
Okay, that has to be planned out. We just don't come in and say, oh, new culture today. We're buying pizza for everybody, and we're going to do dress down Fridays, and we're going to do all these wonderful things, and okay, great, new culture. No, we know that. That's, that's silliness. All right? It ha culture change has to be planned and managed. So it has to be part of our plan. Um, the other things I think are pretty obvious in there because they all impact us. Some of you have been through those things like you know, operational changes and perhaps uh, facility expansions, contractions, those kinds of things, and how they, they impact us. But they've got to be part of our plan. Okay? I want you to take a look at this um, diagram from World at Work. I love this because I think it encapsulates what we do in HR in one picture. Everything, and we started off today, everything starts with our business strategy. Where are we going as a business? Okay, And that bleeds into our organizational culture, but that helps us determine our HR strategy. All that then wraps around everything else that we do in HR. Because let me tell you what, folks. Those, was it five things listed there in the circle? That's our job. That's HR in a nutshell right there when you think about it. Okay? But that's where all the magic is. Okay? And so if we can get, we can't possibly get this right. We can't get satisfied and engaged employees that get us business results if we don't have a strategy and if we have the wrong culture. It's impossible to do that. And so when I look at this, I say, okay, once I know my business strategy is, we've talked about the HR strategy, how do I now then weave that into my entire total rewards program? Because that goes back to that handshake of when we hire someone and we say, we'll pay you this and give you these benefits in exchange for you doing this. And they say, yes, ma'am, I'll do that. Great. And then things fall apart. We talk, that's where we start the day off. Okay? That's where this disconnect happens right here. That's why there's a space there. When there's that disconnect between employee satisfaction and the business performance. So... When you think about things that should be included in your plan that we've not yet talked about, but they bleed in. We have talked about recruiting. We've talked about performance. We've talked about training. We've talked about total rewards. We haven't talked about work life. It's got to be a piece. It's, it's of huge concern to probably everyone in here. Anyone in here not care about work life for yourself? All right, just check in because, you know, if there's some workaholics in here, I, that's okay. That's your work life, okay? For me, as a true Gen Xer, I don't mind working hard, but I want to play hard too. I want there to be a separation. What's the expectation like in your world, in your culture, and does it match up? Work life has to be a huge overlay of everything that we've talked about. If you're going to get employees to buy in and take ownership of their responsibilities, then you've also got to acknowledge that they want to fit their work life together in the way they want to fit it together, not in the way we want them to fit it together. And that's absolutely monstrous change of thought in some cases. Okay, so these are questions I want you to take back. If you want to get an open discussion going in your organization or within your HR department, start asking these questions. Do we know where we are currently in terms of our business strategy? How far into our current strategic plan are we? Are we hitting our goals or not? If HR is not tied into that business strategy, let's get it tied in. I don't care if it's a five-year strategic plan and you're in year four. Start figuring out how to tie your HR plan into it. Don't wait till the next strategic plan rolls out because that's two or three years down the road. That's two or three years of progress you've lost. All right. How can I you know, tie in to the strategic plan? What is HR's role? Hopefully, you've been invited to those strategic planning meetings. If not, and you're the top HR person, ask to be let in. And if you start talking in some of the terms that we talked today, I have no doubt you will be brought in. They'll want you there if you change the way in which you're presenting your information based on some of the things that we talked about today. Okay? And then, you know, just ask yourselves, again, this is all, this is kind of your homework. I said I would give you homework. Okay? What do you need to do about your current strategy? Even if it's not formal, maybe it's just in your head. 
What do you need to do to change it, to make it better, and to fit it into where your organization is going? And again, ask your department that. Ask other business managers that. Ask your VPs that, your owner, your C-suite. Start asking those questions. Sometimes we don't. Maybe we have a little bit of thin skin. We're afraid to hear what they have to say. But it, we, we have to. We have to be open to that constructive feedback. So um, we're right up against it. So from, from a summary standpoint, you know, we've talked about a lot of stuff. And it can be overwhelming. And sometimes what I hear is, Ed, it's, it's, it's too much. I don't know where to start. Just pick one thing we talked about. One of those items in that six-piece circle and say, I'm going to attack this one because I feel like that's where I can have the most impact. Get yourself that impact and get a little bit of steam behind your, your, your momentum. And then you can say, OK, now I can go on and be another one and another one and another one. Next thing you know, you will have your plan. It's going to take time. But don't lock yourself in your office and say, I'm going to knock it out tomorrow. It's not going to happen. Okay? It's going to take months, probably to get an accurate and complete HR plan in place. So give yourself that time to do that. So I have out on the, um, the table some evals. If you don't mind filling some thoughts out and leaving it on the table for me, that'd be great. Um, I like instant feedback um, versus it'll be a couple of weeks, maybe even a couple of months, till I get the feedback from um, you know, your formal feedback, I guess, on your app. So if you have some stuff that you want to tell me today, please tell me. Um, and I will hang out after for a couple minutes. I know you've got to get to your next session, but I'm happy to hang out and answer any questions you might have. So um, thank you so much for, for your time today and your willingness to chat.